Pemaquid Communications, innovative, accessible web design and development from offices in Portland, Maine, on the web at Pemaquid.com. Welcome. This is our Afterthought segment where we keep our guests around from our broadcast program for a little extra conversation. With us today, we have Andy Shepard, CEO of the Maine Winter Sports Center, and more importantly, he is the Maine Biz 2011 Business Leader of the Year uh, Award recipient for the nonprofit category. So once again, congratulations. Thank you. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go back and touch on a couple of things we weren't able to kind of spend more time on um, uh, in, in our uh, broadcast interview. In particular, that, that uh, and we talked about it before in the previous show we did, that how to really measure the impact uh, and how transferable it is for other parts of the region, impact of these kinds of events. Yeah. Um, what, do your chambers do that? or can you put, How do you get to that dollar amount? I mean, I know, I know there's some of it science and some of it's not. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, hopefully as much of it is science as possible. Um, you know, I think what we talked about the last time was that uh, in order to get a really hard number, mm -hmm. y you have to hire somebody who does uh, an in-depth analysis of the, of the traffic, yep. of, um, you know, the actual amount that was spent. They look at receipts. They look at all sorts mm -hmm. of things. It mm -hmm. is a forensic exercise. Right. Um, most of the entities that are holding these events don't have the money to pay for those right. kinds of things. So and I guess that's the thing is, it, that's something that if, if, if the state can invest in that, I know this is not a good time to talk about state investment, but right. the state or the university system, whatever, in terms of doing those kinds of analysis, that, I think that these are really an untapped uh, economic driver for the state. We, it, the return on investment, if we can measure it better, we could then sell it sell the concept of it better to statewide as well. Yeah. I, mean, I think. Anyhow. Well, I think that's true. And I, you know, the assumptions that we made when we said $10 million, mm -hmm. are, I think were fairly conservative. I think Good. it would be helpful to have uh, somebody to take a look at this and come up with the, the, the ripple effects, if mm -hmm. you will, of these kinds of events that none of us are even thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, what other, what right. other um, impacts do these have on the state? that uh, we're not thinking about. And I think too, even in the regions, I believe that there are the things that would really help sell it, so to speak, to the public, to those naysayers perhaps, and other areas too, uh, are those smaller kind of almost under the radar little businesses that are popping up around it that have spun out because of it and right. they're actually creating, they created one new job because of it. Man, that's huge. Right. That's huge. Yeah. I mean, and being able to measure that's difficult. You know, yeah. I think the, the big opportunity here, Alan, is, yeah. is the entrepreneurial industry. That Maine, mm -hmm. that Maine at this point has not taken full advantage okay. of. You know, the traffic that comes as a result of a World Cup, the traffic that comes as a result of all these events in the wintertime, what business opportunities does that create? Mm -hmm. Not the traditional hotels, restaurants, right, shops. Right, right. What other industries are there out there? And I think the big one is a, is a guide outfitter industry that uh, we talked about before, mm -hmm. northern Maine especially really needs to um, take better advantage of. Mm -hmm. Those people exist, but we're not doing as good a job as we need to connecting them to the customers that might be interested. You know, we talked, we didn't mention it this time, but last time we talked about those 120 million viewers in Europe, right, right of this event. Uh, has, have has Northern Maine benefited by that from those folks in terms of any other people seeing this, uh, participating in it, that say, hey, I want to learn more about Northern Maine and what you got up there, maybe starting business there. Have they been able to kind of start getting inquiries? And Yeah, I think it's probably too soon. I, and what yeah. I'd say is that that 120 million number wound up being conservative also. No kidding. Uh, the Fort Kent event in particular set records for... Um, World Cups on <laughs> European broadcasting. Yep. So we won't know the actual numbers till June, but we're expecting that number to be more like 130 million Great. instead of 120. Yep. I would say that the, the impact will be um, one that's felt over time because people became aware of the county through these events, mm -hmm. and hopefully they come to the discovernorthernmaine.com website to mm -hmm. learn more. Okay. So what is next for the s Sports Center? Uh, Boy, there's always something coming next. Um, you know, we're looking at uh, uh, expanding our programming. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at taking our, our competitive programming. We're looking at taking our Healthy Hometowns program year-round. Right now, the That's focus, not. well, our Healthy Hometowns program is our community development program. It's the one that reaches out to kids and tries to create a healthy, active mm -hmm. outdoor lifestyle, basically the one that gets them off the couch yep. and away from the computer and mm -hmm. outside. It's to address childhood obesity and other issues. 
We're in over 100 communities across the state. There are thousands of kids involved in that daily through the winter. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do is transition more of those communities from ski clubs, if you will, into mm -hmm. outing clubs. Mm -hmm. So that we're, we're working with them year round, it, yeah. canoeing, kayaking, mountain biking, trail running, whatever it is. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you too, you were uh, quoted as saying that uh, one of the things they asked you in the, in the interview was the Maine's biggest challenge. I mean, and you said uh, it's size, and you quoted saying infrastructure, it's too expensive for our level of productivity. What, do you, what did that mean? <laughs> um, interesting times to be having these kinds of conversations, but uh, I, I think the state of Maine, that we all know, it's, it's the size of the rest of New England right. combined, right. and yet I think if you looked at the numbers, our population is about one fifteenth or one twentieth of, of um, New England. Mm -hmm. And we have infrastructure spread out across the state. Everybody has their their elementary school, their middle school, their high school, mm -hmm. their superintendent, mm -hmm. their you know, dispatch. Right. Every town has infrastructure. Um, hospitals are spread across the state. It's a difficult subject to try and deal with because you know every one of those communities. They want that ownership of it. Yeah. They're, they're proud of it. Yeah. It's, there's a history, there's a heritage, there's a sense of, um, of ownership and community that goes with and pride that goes with mm -hmm. having all that infrastructure and yet at the end of the day can we really afford all that infrastructure? Right. And you know I think that's what the state is ultimately challenged with trying to deal with. My hope is that you know, this generation decides that we will solve that problem and not pass it on to our children. Do you know the solution? <laughs> that would be a longer conversation. <laughs> I have to think, I think there may be the words, there's some consolidations you're looking for, some greater kind of shared resources, those kinds of things. I think yeah. consolidation, um, a, you know, a practical approach to solving the problems definitely is in, in line. Yeah. And at the same time, you know, just like a business, if, if you're having a hard time meeting payroll, you have to take two approaches. One is you've got to find a way to yep. cut your costs, but the other is you probably have to find a way to raise your revenue. Yep, right. Um, I want to ask you, too, is, uh, it's kind of related to that, I think. Just in general, you pulled off a big deal up there, and you had a lot of help and a lot of support, and you've done a great job. Um, it, what, what, tell us about the political, local political elements that there's got to be... Uh, that tug and pull between communities about how this thing was going to work and how where it would work and all that kind of stuff. How did you deal with that? I mean, nonprofits have that all the time. When they're trying to get something going, it's, it's, yeah. like, it's like holding ping pong balls underwater. And you're trying to keep them all down and you can't. Well, to be clear, the, the, the events were hosted by nonprofit organizing committees yeah. in each community. Yeah. And uh, in the case of the Nordic Heritage Center, organizing committee. That organizing committee was made up of people from as far away as Holton and mm -hmm. you know up to uh, Fort Fairfield and <laughs> Caribou, obviously Presque Isle. Mm -hmm. um, Fort Kent was the same thing. It was kind of a St. John Valley um, organizing mm -hmm. committee, if you will. Those clubs have gotten very good at solving the regional issues that are that come up. Good. And I think what they've identified, and, and appropriately so, is that for an event of this magnitude to be held, they have to leverage all the resources in the region. Yep, yep, they get, we have to hang together, we all hang separately. Kind That's of right. Yeah. yeah, great, okay. Um, and we talked one more uh, earlier about kind of that sustaining the volunteers too. Do you get volunteer fatigue at all? How's that, how do you deal with that? That's inevitable. And I know and nonprofits run into that all the time. Yeah, um, you know, the Maine Winter Sports Center clearly could not operate without the Libra Foundation, the support of Owen Wells. Um, you know, I think the other uh, end of that spectrum is that we also could not operate without the remarkable selflessness of thousands of volunteers across the state. Mm -hmm. And um, from the Healthy Hometowns programs to these big events that are put on, you know, putting on a World Cup event is pretty much a full-time job. Mm -hmm. And for some of these volunteers up there in Rusta County, this was a full-time job for, in some cases, two or three years that they're not getting paid for. Wow. Um, at the end of the day, when the event is over, there is a, uh, you know, a, a period of reflection, we'll call it. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone is tired. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's a time to try and figure out what worked and what didn't work. Um, there are always going to be frustrations with events like this, and the hope is that when the when you move on to the next day, there's a uh, 
the, the evolution of that um, of that reflection is that you recognize how big of an impact mm -hmm. you've had because of, yeah. of the, the effort you put in yeah. and how big of an impact this event has had on the region. Mm -hmm. And clearly th these two events did. And that helps then to revitalize that group and the next group to come forward and work again. Yes. Yeah. Great. Grant, leave it right there. Okay. Uh, congratulations again. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Great. Thank you all.